are you missing out on not using BFR, which is blood flow restriction training? Hello and welcome to this episode with Dr. Warren Bradley. Today we're going to be talking about the use of blood flow restriction training and interestingly, a new clothing brand that incorporates the new technology. Okay, so Warren, can you just tell the listeners a little bit about you? Yeah, no problem. Um, so I spent the last kind of decade working in professional sports and at the same time I was completing a PhD in human physiology and performance nutrition and when did I get the PhD 2017 I completed my PhD um, and I was still working in professional sports up until this year so I went full-time with the uh, business hydro which we'll speak about a little bit later I'm sure um, so during my kind of academia time I published I think I had 12 papers and books chapters uh, over the course of that period on the subject of performance nutrition and that was how I got into elite sport. I was really lucky to be afforded the opportunity to work with Munster Rugby uh, back in 2012 which is right at the beginning of my PhD and since then I've worked with many different football rugby teams. I've worked with England Rugby Sevens, Leicester Tigers, um, Salford Red Devils Rugby League team, Hull City, Derby County just to name a few. Um, I guess it was during the time you're working in a multidisciplinary team. So you're working with physios and sports scientists and coaches. And I saw this kind of really strange um, methodology being used with the players and it was blood flow restriction, which kind of stimulated me to, to think about this business. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of my background and kind of why I've got into blood flow restriction is because I saw it first used in sport with every single team I'd supported essentially. Yeah. yeah, so quite an extensive background in, in sport uh, and obviously yeah. you're, you're now looking at this very specific area uh, of, of training. So just tell us a little bit about what blood flow restriction training is. Okay, uh, so blood flow restriction training, as I said, it's used with, well, it's been used with every single sports team I've ever supported. I can't say uh, conclusively it's used with every sports team in the Premier League Championship, etc. But I've seen it used in every team I've supported. And essentially, it's, um, it's a methodology to rapidly enhance uh, muscle physiology, so size, strength, endurance, power. Um, and it's, it's typically used for rehabilitation after injury or surgery in professional sports. Now, this isn't the only way it can be used, but it's, it's used in this way due to a few logistical barriers. Um, and it's used with really great effect. And anecdotally, I've seen it used. You know, with, with great success, I've seen players maintain muscle mass when they've been in a boot, you know, over six to eight weeks. They've maintained strength somewhat. You know, there's probably been a 10 to 15 drop in strength, which is crazy when you consider it's normally 50, 60% drop off in strength. I'm sure you can give me some clearer stats on that. But um, anyway, the, the augmentation of muscle physiology was just, it was crazy. So I, I saw it while doing my PhD in performance, nutrition, and human physiology. And it kind of really struck a chord with me, the human physiology side of it. So it wasn't particularly my area, but I really, I was intrigued. So once I finished up my PhD, I just wanted to look into it a bit further when I had more time on my hands. And I'll bore you with a little bit of science, if I may, just uh, for your listeners, so just how it works exactly. So um, it, it works by applying a really strong circumferential pressure around the top of the arm or the leg. Um, so it's got to be at the most proximal part of the limb as well for safety. So that's to avoid any kind of um, nerve damage, essentially, from occluding blood flow too low on the muscle. So over the muscle belly of the bicep or the hamstring, for example. <clears throat> and what this does is it restricts the venous blood flow. So arterial blood, oxygenated blood flows into the arm. And the, re the return flow of venous uh, deoxygenated blood is stemmed, essentially. So that's the blood flow restriction aspect. And this is accelerated with low load exercise. So you could even do walking, you could do a slow cadence cycle, or you could do you know, 20 to 30% your one RM with high repetitions. And what this does, it gets more blood to flow into the limb, obviously, as your muscles are contracting. And what happens here is the oxygenated blood is used to fuel the slow oxidative fibers and the fast oxidative fibers, which require oxygen, obviously, to produce contractions. And because there's so much deoxygenated blood building up in that limb, it creates a hypoxic environment, so a state of hypoxia, which um, if, if the listeners don't know, it would just be a lack of oxygen, essentially. And because there's a lack of oxygen, the slow twitch fibers or the fast oxidative fibers cannot produce energy. They cannot contract, so they rapidly fatigue, 
which means that your fast twitch fibers are therefore recruited to help you contract. Now, obviously, under normal circumstances, your fast twitch fibers would only be recruited for uh, strength power kind of movements. So, you know, sprints, one to five RMs on a bench press type thing. But here we have an exercise modality where you're, you're lifting pretty much a can of beans. You know, you're lifting not very much at all. But because of the blood flow restriction in place, this fiber is rapidly fatiguing. All of your fibers are contracting together to uh, facilitate the lift. Um, and it's not just the it's not just the fatigue either of the structures of the muscle fibers. It's also the hormonal effects that are quite um, significant. So what happens is there's a, the cascade of physiological reactions that occur, and that's because of the metabolic stress that builds in the limb. So as the limb is filling with muscle. There's a lot of cell swelling and a lot of lactate buildup and a lot of stress and metabolites building up. And what that does is essentially it, it triggers something called the mTOR pathway, that's the mammalian target of rapamycin, and that is the central regulator for MPS, muscle protein synthesis, which is obviously you're synthesizing proteins in the body and building muscle. So because it's the central regulator and it's heavily um, upregulated, this is why we're getting really um, strong results for hypertrophy in athletes. So essentially, it's two mechanisms. It's one is physical, we're recruiting all our muscle fibers, and the second one is hormonal, we're increasing muscle protein synthesis, even lifting very light weight. Um, now, in terms of kind of use in professional sport, where I've seen it for rehab, it's really important to understand that these athletes cannot necessarily lift anything. You know, when they're bed bound or they're in a period of disuse. They cannot lift any weight, so they rapidly, you know, degenerate the muscle. It rapidly reduces in size and strength. So we now have a methodology where you can be in bed and you can apply a cuff and apply a strong pressure for five minutes and do a few cycles a day, and you're getting all of these hormonal effects even without the exercise, without the physical structural kind of uh, contractions. You're still getting this blood filling and this cell swelling in the muscle and all these hormones responsible for muscle growth. So the other implications of that, it's not just for professional athletes who, you know, post-injury or surgery, it's for the elderly or people with degenerative uh, muscle degeneration kind of diseases. Um, so we can potentially get your granny walking again, essentially, because if you can apply a blood flow restriction cuff to her legs and you can get her to just try and stand up on a Zimmer frame and move around a few steps or even just stay still, we're now augmenting that physiological process and hormones responsible for muscle growth and bone mineral density increases too, um, all without exercise. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite amazing what, what it can achieve. Great stuff. So obviously the, there's processes going on there. In terms of uh, sort of throwing a bit of a curveball question at you here, Warren, in terms mm -hmm. of... Um, what do, we, do we see an increase in muscle fiber number or do we see an increase in mu muscle fiber size or is it a combination of both? What's the literature sort of pointing towards there? Um, as far as I'm aware, so I, I would like to caveat this with I am not a BFR expert yet. So obviously my background is nutrition and human physiology. I'm learning all the time. I'm reading a lot of research. And my understanding is it's the hypertrophy of the muscle fiber rather than increasing muscle fibers. That's my understanding, but please don't quote me on that. I would read the research uh, paper that I've listed at the bottom of this uh, document for your students. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We'll obviously put up all the references from this onto the show notes so, yeah. so people can go away and ha have a little look at those and a further read because you've provided quite an extensive list of all the literature that is supporting this kind of, kind of yeah. intervention. So really my next question is, as a practitioner, I just want to know, is it safe uh, for us to be using and is there anything that we need to particularly do before we start using this kind of implementation? Yeah, absolutely. So um, blood flow restriction training has been around for a while now. It was known as katsu training over in Japan and it's been um, proven to be safe and effective by you know many, many research papers. I think there's, there's over a thousand research papers on PubMed now showing its safety and efficacy. But there are some pretty important considerations that you have to look into. And the, the big one really is the specific placement of the tourniquet. It has to be the, the most proximal point of the limb and that's to avoid nerve damage. And even if you applied a 10 out of 10, um, as tight as you could possibly you know, achieve, cuff or strap on that limb, well, firstly, you wouldn't be able to lift anything because it'd be very uncomfortable to the point it'd be pretty painful. So you would take them off. But secondly, it wouldn't cause any damage because it's in the right place. 
Uh, and this is actually a really big feature of our sportswear garments, which again we'll talk about in a minute. But you do see people putting on the cuffs and straps um, in the wrong position. So I've seen bodybuilders using them before in the gym. And they're applying the cuff on mid bicep or just kind of just above the mid bicep. And this can be really dangerous because you, you're getting nerve damage there. You're actually compressing the nerves. Whereas if you put it at the most proximal point, that's where it's known to be safe and effective. And that's where all the research shows that it's safe and effective. So yes, you have to make sure you apply the cuff or strap or whatever device to turn a you're using at the most proximal part of your limb. Um, there, there is, there is quite an abundance of research now using something called practical BFR. And it was first presented by Lenneke in 2010. I believe it's 2010. And he uses um, yeah, knee wraps, basically, like what you see bodybuilders using in the gym. Um, so they wrap the knees to avoid, um, I guess, stress and strain on the joints when they're doing really heavy squats. So you can use these very same knee wraps at the most proximal point of your limb and use a subjective measure of 7 out of 10 tightness. Now, obviously, a subjective measure, you'd have some physios looking at that, probably going, ooh, I'm not so sure about that. Um, but the research has shown if you, if, you, uh, if you use a subjective measure of 7 out of 10, you are going to achieve somewhere between 50 to 80% of an occlusion pressure in 99 out of 100 cases. And as long as it's on in the right position in the proximal point of the limb, even if they went slightly higher than seven, it's not a problem, as long as it's in the specific placement. And that's why I keep highlighting that. It's very, very important to do. Um, there are, within medicine and within clinical populations, they do typically use something called a limb occlusion pressure. So that's, um, that's setting the pressure as a percentage of their limb, on, yeah, their limb circumference or the systolic blood pressure. And that's to ensure consistency throughout our rehabilitation process so that we know that every time this person wears a cuff or a strap, they're, um, they're applying the same amount of pressure or they're graduating the pressure properly. The problem with that, um, obviously it works for professional sports because you have athletes coming in every single day, seeing the practitioners and being looked after. But when you've got the NHS dealing with it, for example, they, at present, to my knowledge, only provide six BFR sessions in total over a 12-week period post-injury. Now, BFR is something that you have to do consistently and continuously, maybe three to four times a week to see or achieve any results. So, to me, it's completely null and void to bring someone in as a clinician and apply BFR once every, once every two weeks. So, there has to be a more practical method established. And because of the cost implications of the equipment that they use, it seems feasible to me that you would use a practical BFR as, um, as, as a method, a practical method to get them actually doing this at home. Now, again, as I did say, you will have physios looking at this saying, well, I'm not sure about a subjective measure. The research shows it's safe and effective. We can't guarantee it will be the same every time, but the benefits of you being able to do it daily or you know, three or four times a week, as opposed to something once every two weeks, which will have no benefit, to me, kind of makes sense. And also, when I go into my gear, I'll show you that we've actually we've got a numbering system around the around the tourniquet on the arm or the leg, so that we can at least get it within a somewhat the same um, place or or pressure as the previously used. So if you have a six out of ten on our pressure gauge, you go to six next time, and it should be very similar. Um, oh, sorry, there is one more thing as well. It's quite important. So due to the kind of the metabolic stress and the forced cell swelling of the muscle and the restriction of the blood flow, of course, there are a few contraindications that you need to be asking your clients about, such as severe hypertension, you know, history of blood clots, um, history of heart disease. Generally, if they suffer from some kind of uh, condition or contraindication, they're definitely best asking a physical therapist or GP before commencing this type of training because there is stress involved with this training. Yeah, and I know you mentioned there that you could potentially use it mainly <clears throat> in the elderly population, but obviously that obviously comes with that sort of side note that it does need to be in relatively fit and healthy populations at this moment in time. I presume the research isn't like the, and the evidence isn't there in order yeah. to support that use yet. Um, but obviously, with with increasing um, research studies which are going on in this area, then we might be able to get to that point at some time in the future. So where does the evidence really lie Absolutely. at this moment in time? As, as I said, there's probably around, I think I searched on PubMed earlier, there was 1,013 studies at the moment here for, for the search term, blood flow restriction training, occlusion training, and blood flow restriction exercise. 
so the, the research is it's coming along. It is lacking, of course. A thousand research papers isn't extensive at all. Um, most of the research has been done in the elderly, to be fair, and for MSC, uh, MSK rehabilitation. Um, but there are, you know, growing numbers of studies in professional athletes and healthy adults showing, you know, improved muscle physiology in them too. But yeah, you're completely right. It's 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 quite a novel and new technique. I say it's quite novel and new. It's been around for a while, but the research is quite novel and new. It's only been since 2010 that there's really been, I think, 80 to 90 percent of the papers have been published. So we're not quite there yet. We do need to test all of this, and this is why we're actually doing some research studies with Queen Mary's in London um, with with our business Hydro to try and progress this research. Um, so we're really underpinned by science, and we want you know we want to maintain that credibility angle. So it, we will be looking into you know use of different limb occlusion pressures and somehow way to incorporate that into clothing like we have done with the straps as well and make sure it's safe and effective for the elderly excellent so uh, we sort of come on to um your new brand there so hydro uh, and obviously this is and you've made a <coughs> to it in some parts uh one's actually sporting uh, some of the some of the wear now if you are able to watch this on, on the youtube channel or on video and um, so one just want to talk us through the new clothing that is associated with blood flow restriction and um, essentially what it does yeah absolutely i'd love to um you have a few plugs there within the uh, previous statement <laughs> so yeah i saw bfi used with great effect over a number of years and essentially i just thought why is this not being used in gem pop because it clearly works i read the literature it works it's concrete and i didn't quite understand it and i think this is very subjective again but i think it's the lack of accessible information and basically the current logistical and safety limitations that prevent it from widespread use um so logistically it's quite difficult to set up you know you have to have it the most proximal part of the limb as i've, as I've stated about five times so far and it's really important to achieve that for safety so i think because of the safety aspect it's just not being widespread yet There's people aren't plugging it because of that element also if you consider how much sports teams are paying for equipment could be anywhere from 2,000 to 10,000 pounds when you have the proper machinery that uh, dictate pressures uh, that's manipulated over time. Now, of course, that would probably be the gold standard if everyone could afford it and if you could put it in your backpack and travel with it, etc. But the utility of it is just it's negligible. You're not going to be able to do that or use it. So uh, the only other way you can possibly really do BFR is to buy the cuffs online. Now, the issues with the cuffs are they're pretty poorly made to be honest the materials haven't been considered within the research the strap width or the band width or the cuff widths whatever whatever the device is haven't been considered in terms of the research as well they're just kind of thrown together in a factory in china uh, and also without kind of support and use you're going to put them on the wrong place on your limb as i said bodybuilders have put them on the mid bicep or the mid thigh and that's very very dangerous so what i did was i basically thought how do i make this safe and accessible for everyone so I thought, okay, I boiled it down to its components. It's a tourniquet, essentially, that's applied to the correct place on the arm. So I just thought, well, if I incorporate it into clothing and I put it into shorts, leggings for women, and tops for men and, men and women, we ensure that with every single use, because of the specific anatomical placement, it will be used safely and effectively every single time because it's in the correct place already. That, that circumvented that immediately. And that, uh, that has a kind of few... A few positives really so when, when you talk about professional sports they can only do it one player at a time due to the machinery that they have and that's why they only use it for rehabilitation now we have the potential of a product that you can use with a whole squad at the same time it takes five seconds to deploy both arms it is very very quick we know it's in the safe uh, and effective position so this is something that they can now use to augment muscle physiology at the end of a session in otherwise healthy populations rather than just rehab. We can also do it game day plus one because there's no actual significant structural damage to the muscle tissue. It's mainly the hormones that are affected. We can actually, we can actually manage to improve their recovery by using BFR on game day plus one. So what we can do is we can give them tops and shorts to take home and say five minutes of BFR and you're done. Your recovery is done for the day. So it's a really effective way to enhance the recovery for an athlete as well. And obviously then uh, if we talk about medical 
medical use, we can now prescribe. You know, we can send people home with this. We can say, okay, you've had a leg break. You're going to be bed bound for two weeks or whatever. Go home with these shorts, pull them on, just apply the straps, get someone to help you. You don't need to move. You can get the benefits of the hormones. We can um, reduce the atrophy of the muscle. We can increase your bone mineral density if your bone's broken. Uh, and then after that, we can start to rehabilitate at home using only 20 to 30% one RM, which means we're not loading the structures. So the structures are now realistically they're unaffected because we're lifting such light weights or just walking. It's stuff you'd be doing anyway for rehab, but we're also getting the benefits of the hormones released too. Um, and yeah, there's another, there's another few things that we've kind of considered with the top as well. So not just the specific anatomical location, but we've provided the markings so that you can pretty much achieve a very similar reclusion each and every time. I cannot guarantee it will be exactly the same um, pressures applied, but it's going to be there or thereabouts. And also the material blends used for the strap and the specific strap widths have all been considered um, based on the scientific literature. So I've scoured the literature and looked at what the most optimal bandwidth would be for the arm and then for the leg. And it's slightly larger on the leg due to obviously a larger muscle bulk. Um, and this is important to understand because if it's too thin, if the strap is too, um, if it's not wide enough, the occlusion is going to hurt because the pressure is obviously applied over a smaller area. So you're going to probably be more likely to get some damage within the muscle fibers. However, if you do it too wide, it'll probably spread over the bicep or spread over the muscle too far, um, which again, you'll need far too much pressure to be, uh, to be applied to achieve that occlusion. So we, we've achieved a really optimal occlusion using specific bandwidth, specific materials, uh, and in the specific location. So everything is as safe as it can possibly be, essentially. And I would like to caveat this as well with the fact that we are working with the universities and some very well-respected BFR experts to um, build a new device which, for the medical market, which will include a device to uh, assess limb occlusion pressure within the clothing. So we actually own the patent for uh, blood flow restriction or a tourniquet, sorry, incorporated or integrated into clothing. We own it in the UK and we've got applications in for the rest of the world. Uh, so we're just waiting on them to come through now, but we do, we've already had it granted in the UK, which means now we can work on it exclusively with the researchers in London and bring to the medical market a limb occlusion pressure version of our gym wear garments coming down the line, which is really exciting. Super, because I know that obviously that you said that research informed practices is one of your, your key sort of values in terms of ensuring yeah. that uh, the clothing is sort of reaching that high research element and that, that, that level of, uh, what's the word, um, probably trust from um, practitioners who are using it, but also the, the people who are using it um, and wearing those kind of garments. So that, that's obviously a, a, a nice point to sort of finish on that, that you are working on new things and obviously the, yeah, absolutely. The, you've got the the patents in for various different parts of the world, which is exciting. Um, where can we find out more about you, Warren, and about the Hytro itself? Yeah, so you can head to our website, which just launched last week. Um, so that's www.hytro.com. Um, there's also the Instagram page, so it's at Hytro underscore. And uh, shameless plug, you can also get my Instagram at Warren underscore Hytro as well. But yeah, the website I will be directing people to. Great. So um, thank you very much for coming on, Warren. It's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for coming on to the Sports Therapy Community Streamed. And I'll make sure those contact details are within the show notes and also that extensive research list uh, that you, you sent me. So I'll make sure that that's also in there for our listeners uh, and anyone who wants to read it. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for having me, Christian. Um, can I just finish on, sorry, on the website as well, there is a research section. So I've written a lit review on BFR and um, kind of the rationale behind Hydro and why we've come up with this idea. Um, just a bit more detail basically on what we've discussed today. So um, I might give you a link to that. It'd be good to direct the students to. Yeah, exactly. So uh, send that through to me and I'll make sure that it's all in our show notes. Mate, that's amazing. Thanks so much for having me. No worries. Thank you much for your time.